on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Ian Milheiser. He is, of course, the Senior Constitutional Policy Analyst at the Center for American Progress, the editor of Think, Think Progress Justice. And finally, and I feel like, Ian, we've been talking about this for almost a year, uh, he is here to talk about his book, Injustices, the Supreme Court's History of Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted. Ian Milheiser, welcome to the program. It's great to be back. Yeah, I feel like I've been pregnant with this book for so long. It's so good to uh, to finally have it out. So, you know, let's, um, you know, I was interested because there's been, um, I mean, at least one comes to, to mind, a, uh, a book critical of the Supreme Court. Uh, we spoke to Erwin uh, Chemerinsky, uh, I guess maybe a month ago now. Uh, but uh, your book, makes an argument about the Supreme Court that it really is um, sort of foundational. You, you argue that the Supreme Court is sort of problematic from the beginning. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the brief, a brief history of the Supreme Court is we had Dred Scott, which was a pro, big pro-slavery decision, and that was only the second time in American history that the Supreme Court uh, struck down a federal law. After Dred Scott, we ratified three constitutional amendments to get rid of it, and the court spent 30 years writing those amendments out of the Constitution. They, they said that it was okay for African Americans to be massacred in service of a white supremacist government, and they upheld uh, se- segregation in Plessy v. v. Ferguson. They then spent the next 40 years rewriting one of those amendments so that we couldn't have child labor laws, so that we couldn't or so that we couldn't have um, minimum wage laws, so that we couldn't have certain protections for workers. And now, you, you know, you look at what the what the Roberts Court is doing now, and there's very dangerous signs that they want to put us back on this path that the court was on during that forty year period when it was striking down things like the minimum wage under the 14th Amendment and things like child labor laws under a very narrow reading of Congress's power to act. So, so what was, I mean, what, uh, is the Supreme Court just simply ill-conceived? I mean, is that, or is it, I mean, wh- wh- why has it been? And I think it's like, um, it's certainly not, um, and, and of course we're talking about this from a, a left perspective, right? I mean, one, mm-hmm. um, I think, you know, most uh, people of the left have perceived the Supreme Court to have been a um, a fairly a fairly good, um, I guess, a break on the excesses. Or maybe it's just it's associated that way because of a Roe v. Wade. Right. But was the Supreme so, so, I mean, Go ahead. Oh, you know, I, I do discuss, you know, the Warren period and the period immediately after when Chief Justice Earl Warren left the court where the court did score a lot of progressive victory. But, but here's the thing about that period. It was a huge historic accident. On the day that the nine justices met for the first time to decide Brown v. Board of Education, there were three votes to uphold segregation, and two of those votes that were, were on the fence. Um, one of the three votes that was certain, that you know, there was dead set about holding, upholding segregation, was Chief Justice Vinson. Vincent died of a heart attack while the case was still pending, and of course Warren was was the replacement who wrote the Brown decision. Uh, President Eisenhower later said that putting Earl Warren on the court was the biggest damn fool mistake he ever made. Those were Eisenhower's words, because he didn't realize that Warren was going to be such a liberal, and I actually quote some really racist things that Eisenhower said in, in, in Injustices, so that, you know, Eisenhower didn't think that that's what he was getting. There were various justices who either people who didn't get confirmed, or in the case of the segregationist uh, Jimmy Burns, who stayed on the court for a year and then left, who if they had still been around would have voted the wrong way in Brown. Justice Hugo Black was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And by the time he got, so after he got on the court, he, he had a change of heart, and he actually became a, a big advocate of civil rights. But you never would have guessed that based on his record. So there are all these accidents and coincidences and lucky breaks that had to come out for Brown to come down the way that it, that it did. If, if Vincent hadn't died when he did, if Eisenhower hadn't made what he called the biggest damn fool mistake of his presidency, 
if uh, if Hugo Black hadn't had a change of heart, if he'd stayed like he was when he was a Klansman, if Jimmy Burns hadn't left the court, if this guy named Parker that uh, Herbert Hoover wanted to put on the court had been confirmed, there were all these things that had to fall into place. And if those things had not fallen into place, Brown would have come down the other way. And, you know, this magical war in our where all this liberal progress happened probably never would have happened. Well, what what do you think would have happened? I mean, for people who don't know, the I mean, I, I think most people know uh, Brown v. Board of Education uh, of Topeka was a case that basically uh, found that state laws <laughs> that established separate public schools for black and white kids was unconstitutional. What would have, what, I mean, give me a sense of what you think would have happened had those accidents not happened. No, it's a good question. What probably would have happened is absolutely nothing. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. Um, in the lead-up to the Roosevelt presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt presidency, the Supreme Court was terrible. I mean, not only did it uphold segregation, not only did it say that a woman could be sterilized against her will by the state of Virginia, um, but that was the period when child labor laws were being struck down. That was the period when like, basic protections for workers were being struck down left and right. And in the early part of the Roosevelt administration, that was the period when uh, parts of the New Deal were being struck down. So Roosevelt basically wanted to remove the Supreme Court from the zone of economic policy. And like the, the common link that binds all of his justices, some of them were good on civil, civil rights, some of them were terrible on civil rights. Some of them were good on civil liberties, some of them were bad on civil liberties. But all of them believe that the court shouldn't be mucking around with the nation's economic policy. If the war in court had not happened, you know, it's likely that Roosevelt still would have succeeded in getting the court out of setting economic policy. But, you know, the battle would be, but for the war in court, between conservatives who want the court to do all the things, to strike down all the laws that you now see Republicans asking the court to strike down right now, and liberals who want the court to do a lot of nothing. And, you know, that's, that's what the battle was for most of American history. It was between conservatives who wanted the court to do things that were terrible and liberals who wanted the court to please just go away. And um, so, uh, I mean, I guess from a practical standpoint, though, we don't have that decision. Does it end up becoming, I mean, how... How do we get there? I mean, I want to go back and talk about um, uh, the FDR era with the, with the court packing. But, I mean, l- let's presume for a moment that we don't have the finding in Brown v. Board of Education that we had. Do, mm-hmm. I mean, how, what, what happens? Do we, uh, we pass legislation? <clears throat> um, is this just a state-by-state thing? Is it possible that we're still living in an era... Uh, 50, I guess, 60 years later with uh, segregated schools? Well, I think my answer to the question of what would have happened is very much informed by, the, by what did happen. You know, Brown was a very important symbolic victory, and, I mean, it is very important that, you know, the Supreme Court doesn't specifically authorize discrimination. Um, but at least in much of the South, you know, Brown had a tremendous effect in the border states, places like Maryland, where it really did break up segregation. But in the, in the Deep South, there was, you know, Brown had very little impact for the first 10 years after it was decided. It was decided in 1954. By 1964, and this is all in my book, only about 1% of black kids in the South attended integrated schools. What broke the back of Jim Crow was at Brown v. Board of Education. It was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which allowed the federal government to sue schools in order to make them um, in order to make them integrate, which allowed the federal government to cut off funding to uh, state schools that uh, to, to state school districts that wouldn't integrate. And it was the involvement of the Congress and the executive branch in, in, in civil rights, not the court which finally broke the back of, uh, of, of state-sponsored public school segregation. So, you, you know, what we, what we did see in our actual history is that the court wasn't very effective as an institution in doing good. It did a lot of ill throughout American history, but actually wasn't that effective in doing good. 
in the alternate history where Brown came down the wrong way, you know, the, the question is whether Congress would have still passed a law which, you know, provided all of these rights to, for, uh, to integrated schools if Brown hadn't happened first. And that, I think, is an open question. You know, Brown may have given political cover right. to Congress, but it, didn't co- but it didn't fix very much at all on its own. All right, so let's go back, uh, I guess, 15, 20 years or so um, to the, the story of the court packing. I'm sort of fascinated by, uh, by, by sort of the different perceptions of, of what FDR threatened to do at that time. You know, we, on this program, we interviewed uh, Darren Asamiglu, uh, Asam, uh, and uh, he wrote a book... Uh, gosh, I can't remember what the name of it is about the the failure of of of, of nations, and and tied it uh, to the when institutions become sort of divorced from or, or or unresponsive to the people, and over the course of our interview, he actually said his perception of the threat to court pack uh, was actually problematic in his uh, analysis, which surprised me because it seems to me that what FDR did was forced the court to be more responsive to the situation of the people. But, but it, it, give me a, a, a tell people uh, about what it ex- exactly FDR did and why he had to do it. Sure. So, I mean, I don't think there's any question that the problems presented by that era raise an existential threat to the American system of government. You, you, you had this colossal depression, something like 30% of the country was out of work. Roosevelt was doing everything he could to, uh, to, to try to rescue the nation from this depression. And meanwhile, the same Supreme Court, which said that you couldn't keep six-year-olds from working in coal mines and cotton mills, was refusing to allow Roosevelt to, to govern. And finally, in an act of frustration, um, Roosevelt proposed this court packing proposal where he said, well, I'm going to add six new justices to the court. I know they'll vote to uphold the new deal, and this will just remove the Supreme Court altogether from the equation so, you know, we can, we got, so that this country can continue to be governed. Um, if he had succeeded in that plan, and he didn't succeed because, as it turned out, the justices had already voted in secret, you know, to stop blocking what he was trying to do, but if that core faculty plan ha- had taken effect, it would have been very harmful because as damaging as the Supreme Court has been in practice, we do need it to do certain things like apply our civil rights laws to individual cases, and it can't do that if it has no legitimacy. I, I-, I think the one thing I would say, though, is if you're going to look for who to lay the blame at in-, in that encounter, I wouldn't lay the blame at Roosevelt. You know, Roosevelt was elected by the people. He had an enormous mandate. He was fighting against this rogue Supreme Court that was imagining things that weren't in the Constitution in order to push an ideological agenda. And if you want to place the blame at someone's feet for what would have happened if the court had been destroyed as an institution, the blame for that belongs with the Supreme Court of the United States because they shouldn't have been handing down these decisions for 40 years saying that, that the American people aren't allowed to govern themselves. Did, did, did FDR, did his threat <clears throat> force them? I mean, was it his threat? Was it ineffective? In other words, um, was he necessarily going to go through with it? Uh, was, it um, uh, was, was the threat in and of itself effective in sort of breaking the logjam? So this is a crazy story, but it, it was a huge coincidence that about a month before Roosevelt announced the court packing plan, you know, the way that the court operates is like they read the briefs in a case and then they hear arguments and then they meet in secret and decide how they're going to vote. And it isn't until months later that they release a written opinion telling you what happened in that vote. So what had actually happened is shortly after Roosevelt's reelection, and it might have been that some of that, at least one of the justices was, was influenced by the landslide election victory that Roosevelt won, um, Justice Owen Roberts flipped his vote. Um, he'd been voting against New Deal programs. He said, look, I'm just not going to do this anymore. Um, and so Roosevelt announced his court packing plan, packing plan a month after it became unnecessary to pack the court 
But of course, he had no way of knowing that that was the case because Roberts had cast his vote secretly. Interesting. And there's no chance that it was just changed after the fact, right? Because we know, I mean, uh, it's it's widely thought anyways that uh, John Roberts, let's say in the Affordable Care Act case, they changed his man- mind late in the game. That We know that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we, we know, in fact, uh, Louis Brand- Justice Louis Brandeis warned one of Roosevelt's aides that Roosevelt had made a mistake and that if he had only waited a little longer, he would have gotten what he wanted anyway. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> there was also, uh, I, I didn't realize that when Brandeis got on the court, um, he, uh, there was another justice who refused to talk to him for three years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Justice McReynolds, James Clark McReynolds, may be the single worst human being who ever sat on the court. He was lazy. He wouldn't read the briefs. When, uh, at one point, when a woman argued in front of the court, he just he stood up when she got to the podium and announced, I see that there is a female here, and walked away. Um, he turned his back on Charles Hamilton Houston, the legendary uh, black litigator, um, when, when Houston was at the podium and refused to look at him. And he would refuse to talk to the Jewish members of the court, um, and he served with three of them. Um, because he was a, because he was an anti semite, and then on top of all that, McReynolds was the fifth vote to uh, to strike down child labor laws. He was one of the four horsemen, as they were called. He was constantly voting to strike down New Deal legislation. So he was a horrible human being who cast horrible votes. You know, I, I recently did a piece where I uh, ranked the five worst justices in American history. McReynolds was number three. Wow. Who was one and two? <laughs> well, two was, it was Roger Taney, who wrote the, the Dred Scott decision. The worst, decision, the worst justice in, the, in Supreme Court history is a man that few people have heard of. His name was Stephen Steele. He was a Lincoln appointee. It was, you know, in Stephen, appointing Steele was probably the biggest mistake that Lincoln ever made, because Steele served on the court for more than 30 years, he created the intellectual basis for these later decisions that were used to strike down the minimum wage. Um, Field believed that the role of the Constitution was basically to protect business from regulation. Um, and he, you know, throughout his, um, his time on the court, he wrote all these decisions that, are, that led to this libertarian view. He died before the Supreme Court, or he, he died just when the Supreme Court began to implement it. Um, but he built the intellectual basis for those decisions, and he would have gone much further. You know, he wrote a decision where he said that income taxation was uh, an attack of, uh, w- would lead to a war between the rich and the poor. Um, so he was, uh, you know, he was a really right-wing guy, who was very successful in um, eventually convincing a majority of the court to adopt his views. Is there, <clears throat> was there something uh, fundamentally wrong with the development of the Supreme Court? In other words, like what would, I mean, you, there, there's obviously some positive aspects you see to the court, right? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot. I mean, so I think there's two things going on. I mean, there's three things going on. I mean, one is... If you get on the Supreme Court, there's only one type of person who gets on the Supreme Court. It isn't just the lawyers. It's elite lawyers who get on the Supreme Court. And those are not typically the sort of people who have grown up, you know, feeling a great deal of sympathy for the common man. You know, those are not people who often have interacted very much with the common man. So you're picking people from this echelon of society. Um, for a long time, you know, this is the I discuss in the book, Lawyers tend to be very conservative in that they're loyal to these precedents that have sometimes developed over thousands of years. And so for much of the court's history, the bar and the bench were very reluctant to let legislators govern because they thought, who are these upstarts coming in, claiming that they can change these thousand-year-old principles just because they have the will of the people behind them? Um, and, you know, and then the other thing is that the, the, the court is insulated. It serves for life. And it interprets often a very vague document. You know, you, you know I, I, at, at parts of the book, I'm actually very critical of how much of the Constitution has been drafted. Because when you take a document and you write into it that 
people, no one shall be deprived of um, liberty without due process of law. You don't explain what the word liberty means. Or you say that no one will be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures, but you don't say what unreasonable is. Or you say that no one shall be denied the privileges or immunities of citizenship, and you don't say what those are either. What you're essentially doing is you are delegating to the justices the power to say that those words mean whatever they want them to mean, and they have throughout American history said that they mean really terrible things. Right. So, I mean, do you think it was, uh, and, and I want to go back to that sort of the, uh, the question of man of the people, because I want to get your sense about Brandeis uh, in that mm. regard, but do you, I mean, do you think that the Supreme Court was conceived as like another check on, really, on the will of the people? <laughs> Well, it's, it's certainly true that, you know, the idea of an unelected judiciary was conceived to be a check on the will of the people. But it's, you know, and to a certain extent, we want to have that. You, you know, the Constitution says that the government can engage in official censorship. It says it can engage in race discrimination. It, pro- it prohibits all kinds of things fairly explicitly. And we want those protections to be enforced. You know, the, the, the problem is that what makes the justices different than elected officials? If you're an elected official, your legitimacy flows from the will of the people. And for that reason, you're given a great deal of discretion to govern. If you're a judge, your legitimacy flows from a written text. And your decision is good or bad based on whether it can, based on whether it can be squared with what that written text says. And throughout American history, we see time and time again the Supreme Court of the United States not just doing terrible things, but doing terrible things that cannot be found in the text of the Constitution. You know, know, pick up a copy of the Constitution, and I defy you to find a provision saying we can't have child labor laws, you know, saying we can't have overtime laws, saying we can't have minimum wage laws. Well, for that matter, I defy you to find one word in there saying that we can't have a comprehensive regulation of uh, of our health care system. But but liberty... Exactly. I mean, that, that's the thing. Is, is they take the vaguest phrases and they breathe their values into them. And, and that's what I think is the problem. I mean, the word liberty can mean anything. And unfortunately, um, in the hands of this Supreme Court, in the hands of past Supreme Court, it's come to mean, you know, re- really revolting things at times. But isn't, I mean, that's ultimately the dilemma, right? Is that like the idea um, uh, certain decisions can't be squared with the text? You and I, I would imagine, would tend to agree that in certain situations they can't be squared with the text, but that is, it's still ultimately subjective. I mean, that's the weirdest, I mean, the weirdest thing, but that's sort of the most fascinating thing, I think, about just sort of the law and right. the, the whole process of, of divining what the law says, because it's, you know, it's not like the law of physics, you know, there's nothing you can right. do about it. You have a hammer, you drop it, it's going to fall. Um, right. We don't have that same sort of, of clarity. Um, but so let me get back to that question. Do, would it be better for us not to have a Supreme Court? I mean, what's the answer here? Or is this is your book a, a basically a call to those who who think not unlike you and I, I think, in terms of, of outcomes um, that we need to be more diligent in realizing that this is a very sort of dangerous part of our government. Right. So let me give you two answers to that question. I mean, the the first answer is what my answer would be if we actually had a Constitution that was amendable. Because, you know, part of the problem is that we have a Constitution that's so difficult to amend that it's for all practical purposes impossible. If we could amend the Constitution, I would do two things. You know, the first is that I would clarify a lot of the vague language in the Constitution in order to remove this extreme, extraordinary amount of discretion that the justices have. And the second thing I would do is I would implement a nonpartisan um, selection method for, for judges and for justices. And there are a number of states that have done this very successfully. Alaska, for example, has a very good model. So I would model our, our national system of selecting judges off of something similar to Alaska. Um, the problem is that, of course, those would require a constitutional amendment. So in the absence of a constitutional amendment, the only leverage point we really have is election. We've got to make sure that our presidents are going to appoint good judges and that our Senate 
will confirm good judges and reject bad judges. Um, in this election coming up, on the day that the next president is sworn into office, there will be three justices who are over 80 years old and one other who will be pushing 80. Justice Breyer, I think, will be 78 or 79. Um, so the next president could replace four members of the Supreme Court. When you add those four to Justice Thomas, who has already said that he wants to go back to the past decisions that struck down child labor laws and that, you know, under his vision of the Constitution, can't even have the ban on whites, whites only lunch counters. That's what Justice Thomas wants to do. If you add four more of him, I mean, well, you know, we're in for a wild ride. Uh, let me ask you, so how, in Alaska, I'm not familiar with the way that they, they pick those justices, but isn't the, the problem that um, uh, that it's not just a question of sort of partisan perspective, but one of the establishment versus, right? I mean, because it seems to me that, uh, I mean, now perhaps it's more partisan, the idea of, of, uh, of minimum wage, but the, but ultimately when we look at the Supreme court, we have people who still, even the, even the supposed those on the left sort of more instinctively, I think, side with business uh, right. than not, right? And, and, and not just business, but sort of the established moneyed power. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think that you're not going to solve all your problems strictly by taking partisan politics out of it, but you'll solve a lot of them. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, I think it would be especially potent in this moment we're in right now because one thing that's happened in the legal profession you know, the most in, the most powerful legal group in the United States is probably the Federalist Society, which is a conservative legal group. It helped Bush pick his judges. It, it, it helped Reagan pick many of his judges, and it will probably help the next Republican president pick their judges. What the Federalist Society has done is essentially create an alternative legal culture. So if you go back 30 years ago, you know, Nixon and Reagan both, this is something I discussed in the book as well, agreed with the general consensus that we don't want judges setting our economic policy. Those should be elect, left to elect, elected representatives. So you, you don't want judges striking down things like the Affordable Care Act. Um, it wasn't until the Federalist Society built this alternative culture that lionized the justice from the, from the past, the era when we couldn't have child labor laws, and that lionized these very you, you know, narrow visions of what our elected officials can do, that you started to see this culture grow within the right of the legal, uh, the right of the legal community, which breaks with the national consensus. So now you essentially have two communities within the legal profession. You have the mainstream community, which believes that most questions should be resolved by democracy, and you have the conservative community, which believes that we should go back to an era where judges were flexing their muscles a whole lot more in order to strike down laws that conservatives don't like. And it matters a great deal whether you're picking judges from one from the mainline community or the conservative community. And a nonpartisan commission, I think they've been shown to be more likely to pick people from the mainline community. And, and we should say that that's sort of there's a there's a sort of nuanced distinction there between the idea of, like, let's say, the realists who, uh, who, who acknowledge that judges are people and they come to the court with their own experiences and their own sort of, like, perspective on the world versus judges who come to the court with a specific agenda that goes beyond their experiences, but sort of, like, they want to get to a point... Um, uh, uh, B or C that is more of a uh, an ideological one. Right. And, and that's what I think is so scary about the particular moment we find ourselves in right now. You know, if, if you look at how conservatives on the Supreme Court, Republicans in elected positions have behaved since Barack Obama got, a, got into the White House, they've been trying to weaponize the Supreme Court. You know, they, they realize that there are certain things they support that they're not able to win through elections. And so they've been trying to get those things, which aren't, shouldn't be the subject of litigation in the first place, by suing for it. Um, you, you know, you want to you, you, you talk about a culture of litigation. There it is. Right. Um, and 
that's a scary place for us to be in because that culture is not likely to go away if five years from now it's President Walker appointing the judges instead of President right. Obama. What's likely to happen is that Scott Walker wants to eliminate unions. He's not just going to try to get Congress to pass a law in the union. He's going to appoint justices who 30 years from now will still be on the court and who will strike down any law that protects unions. Ian, Ian you, uh, you obviously spend a lot of time talking to people who are, are, are court watchers and in, the, in this community. Is King v. Burwell sort of a, a seminal case in regards to the way that, or do you have a sense that in the way that people will perceive the court? I mean, for me... Uh, it was Bush v. Gore, but in some ways, right. I think like 9/11 sort of diffused what I perceived, particularly at the time, a sort of a growing divide. I think if, if you know, had 9/11 not happened, the biggest controversy I think by the fall of 2001 would have continued to be that uh, that um, that court case. Um, it, that's my opinion, and it was. I guess it was also going to be on the cover of Newsweek even in September uh, of 2001. Do you think King Verb Barwell is sort of fundamentally uh, different in that regard? Because it, it, it seems to me um, people, uh, just court watchers that I've been talking to, um, they, they all sort of universally just say, like, this is just sort of impossible to conceive of. Yeah. No, King is the case that seeks to defund much of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it seeks to, you know, millions of people will lose their health care. Thousands of people will die every year if this case goes the wrong way. And I think what ultimately King is about is whether we have a Supreme Court that is dominated by conservative judges or whether we have a Supreme Court that is dominated by Republican politicians. Right. Because, you know, the, 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 the legal argument in King would be hilarious if the stakes weren't so high. You know, you, you know the, the argument is that you can read one sentence of the entire Affordable Care Act out of, uh, out of context and not look at all the other language of the law, which makes it very clear that um, these tax credits that the law provides should be available in all 50 states. Don't read those parts. Just read that one sentence that you like if you're one of the king plaintiffs in order to get the result that you want. That's obviously not how the law is supposed to work. And if there are any judges, on the Supreme Court who are willing to buy that theory. I, I don't think you can fairly call them judges. I mean, at that point, if they accept such a ridiculous theory, they, 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 aren't, they, they aren't engaged in a legal process. They're just, um, they're just enacting their own partisan preferences. I don't know. I mean, I'm actually fairly optimistic that, that we're going to win King just because I think that the legal theory behind this case is so dumb that at least one of the conservative justices is going to say, look, like, you know, I, I got a law degree and, like, I, I know too much to, 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 to buy into this draft. Um, but there's no guarantee. You know, what we're going to find out is of the five conservative members of the court, you know, which ones are conservative judges and which ones are Republican politicians. Interesting. All right, lastly, let me ask you this. Who, who is your favorite judge? My favorite judge in, in, in history or, yeah, or, in history. or right now? In history. Well, that, that is a big question. You know, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble for saying this because I, I, I just recounted what his bio is like. But, you know, Justice Black, after he became reformed, after he set aside his, his racist past, I think, you know, of the justices who gave, did the, made the most serious effort to reconcile the fact that we have a written constitution and the words of those constitutions have to mean something with the fact that, like, you don't want judges doing so much stuff that, that, that the nation becomes ungovernable. Um, you, you know, I think that the period when he was on the court, it was after all of these decisions blocking the New Deal, striking down child labor laws, after all of these were overruled, and the members of the court were very much struggling with, okay, what is our role now? And I think that, you know, he did the best job as a justice, although not as a person before that, of grappling with this question of how do we continue to enforce people's rights that are actually written in the Constitution without overstretching our legitimate authority as unelected officials. Interesting. And where do you put Brandeis? I mean, Brandeis was a fantastic judge. I mean, you know, Brandeis, 
Brett Hess also got on the court at a very different time. You, you know, the liberalism of the early 20th century was very much anti-judiciary because whenever the judiciary did something, it, it, it was terrible. And so Brandeis was often just saying, you know, court, please stop doing things, you know, with the exception of the First Amendment context. And that's not where I am. I mean, I, I think that the Constitution does provide very clear protection. You know, you know, it's very clear you can't have government censorship. It's very clear you can't have race discrimination. It's very clear that the criminal being accused enjoy certain protections. And those rights are sacred and they should be protected. You know, and I criticize the court as much for when it has failed to do those things as when it has written new rights, you know, quote unquote rights, things like the right to be paid very little for doing, uh, you know, immense hours of work um, into the Constitution. You know, I think that the best examples of the judges we've seen throughout American history are the ones who realize that, you know, their power is limited, but within the confines of its limits, it's very important they do exercise it. Ian Milheiser, the book is Injustices, the Supreme Court's History of Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted. Put a link to it at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much for having me.